Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming for this uh, afternoon a panel called A Chilling Climate, uh, the Foreign Agent Laws and their Ripple Effect. Uh, we will talk especially uh, on uh, uh, various phases of, uh, uh, of the foreign agent law in uh, uh, various countries uh, in uh, uh, Central and Eastern, uh, Eastern Europe. Sorry, could you please uh, close the door? Thank you. So once more, welcome. I'm very happy uh, that, uh, that I can welcome our three guests, three lawyers. Uh, it's uh, uh, Tamara Gurciani, uh, who is Deputy Chief of uh, Party at the Georgian uh, USAID uh, Civil Society Engagement uh, Program, which is implemented by the East-West uh, Management Institute in uh, Tbilisi. Then it's uh, Ivana Rosenzweigova, Senior Legal Advisor uh, from uh, European Centre uh, of uh, Non-Profit Law. Uh, Ivana is based uh, in, uh, in Prague. And then it's uh, uh, Bistrik Antalik, uh, lawyer at the uh, Office of uh, Plenipotentiary for Development of uh, Civil Society uh, of uh, Slovak uh, Republic. And my name is uh, Sabina Malcova, and I'm uh, head of uh, DEMAS, uh, what is uh, a uh, Czech uh, platform of uh, Czech NGOs working on uh, political human rights, um, uh, support of uh, democracy and uh, civil society. Um, today, uh, we, will, we will discuss uh, several, uh, several topics connected uh, as I said, with various phases of uh, of the foreign uh, foreign agents law, um, our objectives uh, are that during this afternoon session we would like to uh, analyze the spread and uh, impact uh, of uh, these laws in um, uh, in Europe, uh, focusing on how these laws uh, are reshaping the uh, civil society space. Uh, then um, we would like to find the way how to understand the broader implications of uh, these laws. And finally, we would like to discuss uh, uh, strategies, mainly advocacy strategies, for um, uh, resisting negative effects uh, of uh, foreign agent laws on, uh, on a civil society, uh, on, uh, on the uh, on, on the whole space uh, civil society uh, works in. So, um, I have a bunch of uh, questions for, for my colleagues, for, um, uh, for our three, three experts in, in these topics. And uh, I guess that we can, uh, we can discuss it, uh, it now for some 45 minutes and then you will have, uh, I guess, enough space uh, to uh, to have uh, your uh, your questions, so um, I would start uh, with uh, uh, introduction to to this topic, uh, and uh, I would uh, like to ask Ivana if uh, she can explain uh, the foreign agent law, how how it began, what is important, and how it uh, spreads in uh, in Europe. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Great. Uh, so good afternoon. Um, as Sabina mentioned, my name is Ivana Rosenzweigova and I represent the European Center for Not-for-Profit Law. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and also thank you to everyone for uh, coming to this session. Before I start talking about um, how the foreign agent law spread and uh, what are the common elements of these types of laws, um, I would like to just um, kind of uh, have a note on um, the concept. Uh, basically, these laws uh, can take very different forms and shapes. Um, we refer to them during this session as foreign agent laws, but they could be also called foreign influence or foreign interference laws, you name it. They can, they can be called differently. And uh, these laws have been uh, around for quite a while, actually. Um, started off 
in this form as uh, restrictions to foreign funding. Um, as early as uh, in 2001 in Belarus, um, there was uh, a law adopted that uh, restricted um, foreign funding for civil society organizations. And uh, it was a different type of regime. Uh, basically, organizations that wanted to receive foreign funding would have to receive uh, a permission to, re to, to do so. And uh, the law itself uh, basically quite narrowly uh, defined purposes that were allowed for this type of funding. Um, and uh, basically, there were criminal penalties introduced for non-compliance. The foreign edges laws that we are talking about um, right now that are spreading around Europe um, recently um, are similar to the law that was introduced in Russia in 2012. Uh, they are oftentimes uh, presented as uh, coming from, rather coming from uh, the US FARA law uh, that was introduced already um, in the mid uh, 20th century. Uh, that was basically uh, introduced for, uh, for a different purpose. Uh, but uh, maybe we can also go through the elements and with the elements also like define what the differences between these laws are. Um, so one of the common elements of these laws um, is that they are introduced um, to provide some form of transparency but the in public decision making, but the covered entities, so the entities that the law applies to, are um, non-profit organizations. That's the case uh, for the laws that are following the example of Russia. And um, um, in some countries, they can also cover um, other legal forms like media organizations in Georgia. Um, the difference, uh, for example, with the FARA laws uh, or even with the uh, EU Defense of Democracies that uh, they cover a broader range of legal entities and they don't only target uh, non-profit organizations. Um, another common element uh, of uh, these laws is that they define uh, like, uh, the type of support that qualifies uh, for triggering the obligations under this law and also a form of activity and agency with the, uh, with the donor or with the funder. Type of support can be financial, it's usually financial, but uh, in some cases it can be also non-financial support. Um, there was the case, for example, in Bosnia where the um, foreign interference law was uh, recently withdrawn uh, in Republika Srpska, and uh, this law was uh, basically covering also non-financial um, non support, so organizations, uh, let's say, uh, even from the EU, uh, they would come and, I don't know, organize a workshop with local organizations would already be triggering um, this obligation under the foreign agent law, even though they are not providing financial support, already the non-financial support would be sufficient. Um, regarding the activity and agency, uh, so the laws basically differ in uh, whether um, you have to engage in some form of activity or it's sufficient to receive the support from the donor. Um, um, also, the laws can define some form of agency uh, relationship. So, for example, the US FARA law would say that uh, um, in order for you to be a uh, I don't know, representative of uh, foreign government or foreign uh, agent, uh, you would have to have some sort of agency relationship with the funder. Um, the Russian style law would, would basically not even look for this uh, agency relationship and would basically cover any activity um, as long as you're receiving funding from the type of donor. Um, these laws also um, provide um, um, kind of like a regulate type of foreign uh, funders that qualify. So basically, um, a lot of laws um, actually um, actually um, qualify for uh, the support that uh, from all individuals and legal entities. Like for example, uh, the recently introduced draft law in Slovakia, Georgia, and Bosnia. Um, in um, some 
in some other legislation like the EU Defense of Democracy, it would be mainly um, um, it would be mainly uh, funding from uh, third party governments, but there is also a problematic provision that could potentially qualify also private legal entities for, um, for this type of support. And finally, these laws have also in common that they, uh, of course, uh, provide obligations and penalties uh, for the covered entities. Uh, so one of the obligations is uh, natural registration and uh, reporting requirements. Uh, they oftentimes provide also uh, labeling uh, type of uh, obligations, uh, basically um, requesting uh, the covered entities to um, provide, uh, put on uh, their publications or any type of work labels such as uh, organization receiving uh, support from abroad, etc. Uh, they also provide investigating and um, quite broad investigative and audit powers to the government authorities and uh, potentially also bans on uh, certain activities like political activities in uh, the recently withdrawn law in Bosnia. Finally, I would just like to mention that uh, the laws um, that I was talking about that are following um, the Russian example um, were found to violate international human rights law. Um, the Probably most of you are familiar with the case of Hungary and the uh, uh, court of Justice of the European Union, where the Court of Justice found that um, uh, basically the law is singling out NGOs and presenting them to public as uh, mm, this type of foreign enemies was stigmatizing and creating a climate of distrust and therefore violating the human rights law. And similarly, uh, the, the Russian law was found to violate the European Convention on Human Rights. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Ivana. Thanks for the theoretical background. And uh, me as a person working with uh, human rights defenders, uh, I'm very happy that you mentioned Belarus uh, as a cradle of this law in, uh, in Europe because people usually think that uh, it goes uh, from Russia only. However, I guess that Lukashenko is uh, quite good in squeezing uh, a civil, a civil society. I would move to, uh, to Tamar because Tamar is from Georgia. And uh, in Georgia, it was freshly adopted, this, uh, this law. And so, Tamar, could you uh, tell us uh, about the Georgian case, about uh, implications, um, how can NGOs uh, operate uh, practically in, uh, uh, in Georgia? What is also the psychological aspect behind it? Because it's uh, not easy to be, to be labeled, uh, how, the, how the general society um, adopts uh, this uh, this labeling, and um, because in Georgia it's not uh, only connected to the um, uh, foreign agent laws, but uh, also to uh, to the law of uh, financing of political parties. Whether you can also touch uh, this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sabina. When you asked me about implications of this law, I listed uh, the implications, and I have eight. So I hope I have time to, the, to discuss all of them. Uh, definitely, it was adopted uh, in June, and as of now, the, we have only 20 organizations that are published uh, in that register, but according to the Ministry of Justice, uh, 469 organizations have applied uh, when the law was enacted out of uh, 32,000 organizations reg registered uh, at the Ministry of Justice. Uh, of course, it has significant negative implications for Georgian civil society. First is uh, that it just limits their operational capacity because this scrutiny that uh, they, are, uh, they are under at this moment is unprecedented and it's a heavy administrative burden for organizations to compl comply with these uh, requirements. A uh, financial declaration that, uh, that uh, has to be submitted to the Ministry of Justice is so complex, so complicated, that even the Ministry of Justice does not have the, uh, have, uh, the human capacity to, do, to deal with uh, everything. A second uh, the thing that I would, I would, the implication that I would mention is uh, uh, discouraging civil society organizations uh, from applying you know, for grants. 
some of them filed for non-operational status because the liquidation process is also quite complicated. It will take you forever to liquidate your organization, and also you you will just you would just open doors to the revenue service yourself and show all the financial dat uh, data yourself. Otherwise, they they are not going to uh, um, liquidate you. Uh, the increased negative rhetoric um, uh, against CSOs, you already mentioned that, it's not new. Um, yet, uh, civil society organizations, especially the most powerful leaders, have been attacked uh, verbally by the government. Uh, and uh, at this moment, uh, during the pre-election campaign, some of the pictures of civil society uh, leaders are used uh, in the ruling party's negative campaigning. It's really horrible to watch. It, it definitely has, has a very negative impact on, 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 on their lives. Um, next uh, thing is uh, that non-compliance uh, uh, can result and uh, will definitely lead to really heavy fines. Um, that none of the civil society organiza organizations can really uh, afford to, uh, to, to pay. Only maybe Tbilisi-based uh, big organizations can, can do that. And, and it's a huge burden. And I'll just remind you that hundreds of civil society organizations um, have publicly stated that they would not comply with the law and they would, they would rather kill the organizations than, than register in, in, uh, regis uh, in that register. And also, uh, no one really does that in Georgia. Uh, uh, I, just, uh, I just started reflecting on that, uh, how important it uh, is to do this intersectional uh, assessment of the context. Uh, I had no idea that civil society organizations who, who, who are operating in rural parts of Georgia uh, have already chosen between um, uh, between um, continuing their work, uh, which is heavily dependent on cooperating with the local government, or just uh, 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 stop uh, stop everything uh, they do. Um, definitely, uh, some uh, the law impacts uh, some groups differently, and these groups are civil society organizations who. Uh, who have overlapping identities and social positions. I mean the organizations who, um, who operate in rural parts of Georgia as well as marginal, marginalized uh, groups like women, LGBTQI, group, uh, LGBTQI individuals and ethnic minority groups. Uh, they face worse challenges and uh, the, this law increased their vulnerability and uh, further increased, unfortunately, unfortunately inequalities that are already pr uh, present. Uh, and you also mentioned other laws like uh, political uh, uh, finan uh, financing. Um, this law uh, uh, has very negative implication for, for the election observation groups because, because uh, uh, according to our anti-corruption bureau, uh, they, uh, they might have political goals. So that's why they, they, should, uh, they should fall under, uh, under their jurisdiction. And they already attacked the, one of the major, uh, major um, uh, election observation groups, Transparency International Georgia. And the last thing I want to mention, it's an implication for the entire country, which is EU candidate status that we, that we got. And, uh, and the EU uh, absolutely explicitly is saying that if you, if you enact this law, then, then there will be no accession talks, uh, et, et, et cetera. Uh, so for the country, which is, uh, which is uh, the most pro-European uh, country probably outside of the EU, because 86% 80, of Georgians are, uh, are supporting the uh, EU and EU membership, it means that uh, this law does not just go against civil society in Georgia, but against uh, the entire country. Uh, thanks. And uh, how how does the law um, impact uh, international cooperation and uh, the flow of uh, foreign aid? Uh, I mean, uh, especially from Western uh, donors, uh, which has traditionally uh, supported uh, uh, the Georgian uh, civil society. I'm not talking only about the EU, but also American money. Yeah, definitely, that's a good question. 
it is already affecting diplomatic relations and cooperation. Uh, you know that USAID uh, uh, stopped the direct assistance of uh, $95 million to the government and also instructed all, all their programs to, uh, to, to pause all the activities uh, from which the government of Georgia is directly, directly benefiting from. Same applies to other donors. I don't really know any donor who, uh, who, who wants to engage directly with the Georgian government at, at this moment because, because they are so toxic and they are so brutal to, to, to the civil society organizations and media organizations. Uh, and as, um, as uh, Ivana already said, this law does not apply just to civil society organizations who are receiving uh, more than 20% of their non-commercial income from foreign sources. It also applies to the media organizations. And uh, media organizations who are receiving uh, more than 20% of their non-commercial income from foreign, uh, from foreign sources are usually the ones who are the most in independent and impartial. Definitely, that's not very positive. No. Well, <laughs> thanks, uh, Tamar. Um, we will move to the Slovak case. Uh, that's the reason why we have uh, Bistrik with us. Um, Bistrik, could you tell us uh, how it uh, looks currently with the uh, with the uh, foreign uh, uh, foreign law in uh, Slovakia? Because it's uh, already being prepared. So then, whether you can tell us more. Um, thank you. <coughs> The proposal was proposed by a group of uh, members of parliament uh, for uh, uh, Slovak National Party. Uh, it uh, happened in spring and um, uh, the situation nowadays is uh, that in our parliament uh, there are three rounds of uh, readings if uh, someone uh, proposes some proposal. Uh, this proposal should uh, go through these three readings. And uh, this proposal about foreign agents uh, uh, went just uh, f uh, the first round of uh, readings. So we are waiting for the next round. And uh, by our information, it uh, should happen uh, in, uh, at the end of this month, uh, in October. But uh, newest information are that uh, this uh, maybe uh, will not be the case because uh, we have, uh, or the government and the parliament uh, should discuss uh, more uh, sorry um, uh, the end of the year is coming and uh, uh, every year there should be a bill about uh, state uh, budget thank you so this will be the topic in parliament uh, anyway uh, we uh, reacted in the spring uh, to this proposal and uh, the main um, problems with this proposal uh, from our point of view were first of all labeling in NGOs as organization with uh, foreign support, so labeling as uh, foreign agents, but in uh, our, or, uh, the proposal of uh, members of parliament, it is uh, organization with foreign support. So this is the main problem. Uh, the second problem from our point of view of this proposal was a uh, possibility of dissolution of uh, an organization by Ministry of Interior in case of uh, non-compliance. And uh, the third, but uh, 
but least uh, was uh, abolition of protection of uh, donors' anonymity. So we prepared a paper for the government office and also for the members of uh, parliament uh, who uh, proposed this uh, proposal uh, where we argumented uh, that uh, this is uh, not a good way to to strengthen the tra transparency of financing of uh, NGOs. So, so do you think that the uh, transparency, it's like uh, uh, one of the uh, m most important reasons behind, uh, behind the, uh, this law? Or uh, what are like other reasons why, uh, from your perspective, uh, you think that uh, it's necessary to have uh, to have such a such a law controlling uh, NGOs in uh, in Slovakia? Because all in all, most of them they have to submit uh, annual reports plus financial reports to the financial revenue office. So then, it is absolutely clear whether you are financed. Uh, and uh, in certain um, percentage uh, from from abroad. Yes, this is uh, this is true, but uh, not all uh, types of NGOs uh, are obliged to do this uh, to uh, issue uh, annual report. Uh, we have uh, in Slovakia we have five types of uh, NGOs, and uh, the citizens assemblies uh, are not obliged to uh, issue an uh, annual report. So, uh, in my opinion, it is important uh, to have a transparent financing, but uh, this can't be uh, realized by uh, labeling NGOs, because, again, it is uh, just my opinion, that, uh, let me say it uh, this way, I don't care from where the finance uh, came, but it should be transparent. Uh, the donors and also uh, how the money was spent. Thanks, uh, Bistrik. I would maybe move uh, to, to Ivana uh, to have uh, the, the broader scope um, for these uh, official uh, re uh, reasons behind, uh, behind the legislation and uh, like what might be the motivations of uh, the EU um, uh, defense democracy package um, and uh, how it changed uh, after the pushback from uh, CSOs. So um, the motivations behind the EU defense of democracy are, um, I ca are kind of clear, I would say. It's uh, transparency following the corruption scandals uh, that happened at the EU level. I would just like to note that uh, the defense of democracy package would um, basically uh, provide obligations for the member states to create uh, transparency registers as opposed to a transparency register at the EU level with the institutions because there is already such thing uh, existing at the EU level. And uh, of course, uh, now, what does it mean, transparency? We, I was just talking about, um, you know, uh, these foreign agent laws that are following the Russian style uh, legislation and they are also introduced, um, you know, for the same transparency purposes. And sometimes it's uh, very awkward uh, to go basically outside of the European Union and talk with, uh, you know, groups, uh, let's say in Georgia or in Bosnia, um, about, uh, you know, how these types of proposals can damage uh, civil society in their countries. And then at the same time having a similar proposal um, you know, pending at the EU level. So I will briefly explain just the 
basic differences between these uh, these two laws, but then I would also explain what is problematic actually with the EU defense of democracy. Um, just to like very briefly explain, as I said before, um, the the covered entities are basically different for um, the EU defense of democracy versus uh, the foreign agent laws. So basically the EU defense of democracy um, doesn't want to target only uh, non-profit organizations and uh, their type of um, their type of advocacy. Uh, what is uh, problematic though, and I will not go into a big analysis because we created that and I'm happy to share with you the policy paper uh, that we prepared as ECNL but also as a broader coalition of uh, civil society organizations led by Civil Society Europe. Uh, you will find uh, that we had actually quite a lot of issues and we raised a lot of arguments but the key one that I would like to mention is that um, is basically the definition of uh, the interest uh, representation service providers on behalf of uh, third countries, which is basically the obliged entities, so if we want to translate it into a human language, uh, which are, um, for civil society organizations, it would basically mean that uh, CSOs that are receiving uh, funding from a donor from outside of the European Union because they are aligned on the priorities, on the funding priorities with the donor, would be uh, considered as interest uh, representation service providers of this country, which uh, goes uh, totally against uh, the core principle of uh, how civil society organizations actually work because they um, basically conduct, carry out their activities to um, uh, to further their mission, basically. So that's uh, that's the most problematic uh, part for us uh, of the whole um, EU defense of democracy package. Now, regarding the pushback, as I mentioned, we are part of uh, the broader coalition of CSOs that is led by Civil Society Europe. And uh, one of the things that we were pushing for is a new, uh, if, if nothing else, then at least a new uh, impact assessment because in the current form it's uh, insufficient. Uh, it does not really go too deep into the risks and does not uh, also go too deep into the safeguards that would mitigate these risks. Um, so that would be basically like one of the main, uh, main requests that we align on. And uh, now I don't know that uh, about any uh, new draft uh, being developed, we just hear rumors uh, from about you know support of different states. That's how the EU politics works. Some uh, some states are supporting, some states are not supporting, and uh, so so I don't know if there's like a, anything uh, more specific developed. But based on I would say also the advocacy of civil society organizations, there are three things happening. One is that the fundamental rights agency will be providing. Um, some brief analysis of, uh, of the key points that we raised, although it's limited uh, in scope. Um, there was also an open letter issued by four UN special rapporteurs uh, that were basically criticizing um, this proposal. And uh, besides raising the stigmatization of civil society issue, uh, they also mentioned that there is a potential significant impact on um, uh, participation of civil society organizations in uh, decision-making processes. And uh, finally, we've just heard from, um, uh, we've just heard about a new uh, IMCO commission study um, that uh, also, IMCO is a committee, one of the committees, uh, and uh, they recognized uh, also basically the argument that we were raising with the uh, with civil society organizations basically pursuing their mission instead of uh, acting as uh, third country or you name it interest representatives. And I think uh, that's it from my end. Have I answered your question. Yeah, yeah, you did. You you already did so. Um, I would again switch from the theoretical scope in, into the practical one um, because when we have a look, uh, for example, 
uh, on Russia uh, as an example of uh, the implementation of the foreign agents law. Um, a lot of uh, NGOs and uh, its leaders uh, were banned. Um, had to had to face uh, not only a labeling but uh, uh, huge psychological press uh, not only from the state uh, authorities but also from from the society uh, and they had to uh, emigrate and work from exile so Tamar do you think that it might happen also in in Georgia uh, how can you face to uh, to these uh, patterns, like not to follow uh, follow the the Russian pattern too much? Do you have any any possibilities? Uh, does it work? Uh, yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Sorry. Uh, if you have uh, any uh, advocacy possibilities, or how how can you fight against uh, that law? There is a huge difference between Georgia and Russia when it comes to this law. Last year, when the, when the when our ruling party first introduced this bill, uh, and and we killed it in a few days uh, because there were there were like huge uh, protests outside of the parliament building. Uh, we were saying that it took Putin ten years to finally suffocate and kill the entire civil society in Russia. But in Georgia, uh, he was not successful. Um, and people who like him were not successful. But yeah, the, we fought back last year, but they struck back at us this year. So it's like never ending. And if you asked me last year, why would the Georgian dream do such a stupid thing? I would say that they, they were just repeating whatever Putin was doing in Russia or Viktor Orban in Hungary, but uh, they, they really had this plan. And one of, the, uh, one of the parts of their plan, I think, is exactly what you just uh, said, to get rid of these uh, people who are not uh, thinking like them. Migration of uh, uh, activists and brain drain uh, means that there is less resistance at home and more human rights violations uh, without accountability. Also, they don't, uh, uh, what we can uh, expect is the, uh, general, uh, gen uh, in general, decreased international support for democratic movements um, because no one really wants to support countries uh, that, that, uh, that, that, that have these authoritarian uh, practices. How we can deal with that? Uh, we are already dealing that, uh, with that, I think, but uh, there is a huge difference, as I said, between Russia and Georgia. When I was listening to uh, one Russian expert at Wilson Center uh, who gave this lecture about foreign agents law in uh, Russia, uh, I asked him what was, what was this difference. And he told me that no one talked to the common people in Russia. He referred them like that. So uh, unlike in Georgia, where we do these public uh, education campaigns to raise awareness about, uh, about uh, the, uh, the work of civil society organizations and the public support uh, uh, they built is unprecedented now. Uh, in Russia, general public did not even know that uh, this, uh, this law was going to be adopted by the Russian Duma. And also, they had no idea that uh, the government would go that far. But uh, also, Russian uh, civil society organizations did not really have any example to refer to. But we do have that example, and we know what is coming. That's why I think that uh, uh, I think that Georgian case will be absolutely different from whatever happened in Russia, unfortunately. Thank you. Ivana Bistrik, would you like to add something to these practical scopes? I think Georgia is super inspiring in what they're doing. Uh, at the CNL, we um, also prepared um, this kind of um, publication called CSO Resilience Case Studies, where uh, CSOs from Hungary, Slovakia, and Serbia 
were talking about how they were um, how they were like designing uh, campaigns uh, for the protection of civic space. So I can share this again with uh, participants. They are they are also very very inspiring. But uh, yes, we always uh, promote uh, the Georgian example as well. Thanks a lot. Um, I guess that uh, we introduced the topic to you, uh, so then I would open the floor for your questions because I know that there is a f uh, at least a few of you uh, here that uh, who are interested in uh, uh, in that topic. So, any questions? Thank you very much. My name is uh, Roman Lisram from the Office of the Public Defender of uh, Slovakia. Um, I have one question regarding the foreign funding. Uh, hopefully one day a government will come that will repeal um, this law, but um, I would like to hear your opinion on maybe in, if you know some examples where this uh, uh, where such norms have been in effect for some time and then they have been repealed, uh, what happened to the no donors? Because the examples, at least in Russia, show that the um, foreign support tends to dry out, uh, whether they return or whether this <coughs> is more of a permanent effect that will cripple the civil society for long, long after the law has been repealed. I can start and maybe Tamar or District can add. Um, so the <coughs> Slovak uh, draft law uh, very much resembles the Hungarian law that was basically found non-compliant with the EU legislation and was struck down uh, by the European Court of Justice. But as we know, um, uh, the authorities there found a different way how to regulate. Um, at the same time, uh, hearing from civil society in Hungary, it feels like uh, they were able to come together and to create this, uh, you know, strong kind of coalition uh, that is supporting each other even through these times. So that would be to your question about whether it's permanent. And um, sorry, what was the other part? Um, I, I mean, yeah, I oh, the donors, the donors, uh, yes. Do you want to say something about the donors uh, in Georgia? At this moment, I hope it never happens in Georgia, but at this moment, uh, all the donor organizations who are saying that they, 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 uh, they would stop any direct assist assistance to the government, they also say that they would divert the resources to the civil society organizations. That's very good news. But also, uh, as I have already said, uh, the operational capacities will be uh, will be limited, and uh, I don't know if uh, civil society organizations will be able to to uh, to handle that because it also requires uh, re uh, it also requ requires human uh, and organizational capacities. Regarding uh, the Slovak uh, proposal, personally, I do hope that uh, this will change. Uh, the labeling will be cast out. Uh, also, uh, the dissolution will be by the court, not by the Ministry of Interior. And uh, the protection of uh, donors' anonymity will be preserved. So, uh, the proposal is uh, just in the uh, second round of uh, reading, so we will see how it uh, will be at the end. But personally, I do hope it will be different. Um, can I have a question, Fedor Blaschak from OSF uh, on district, uh, Antalik, uh, to follow up on your answer? That, uh, you said that you believe. Uh, are there some consultations uh, going on now uh, between uh, planning potentiary office and the legislators uh, from Ministry of Interior, maybe Ministry of Justice, maybe the, the, the 
members of parliament that uh, proposed the law. So this is the first question, whether there are ongoing consultations and what is the subject of the consultations. Uh, as you said that you believe that these three things, uh, the three points will, will change. So are uh, those uh, uh, MPs uh, uh, willing to, to, uh, to, to change it? Thank you. Uh, the last consultation was uh, in uh, start of September, and from then we didn't consult uh, it, but uh, at the, this consultation, it was consultation with the government office and uh, uh, with the members of parliament, uh, which uh, proposed this proposal as well. And we have, I can say, we have an agreement uh, that uh, the labeling uh, as uh, NGOs, as uh, foreign supported organization will be deleted from this proposal. And uh, as uh, also uh, there will be uh, different uh, sanctions as were proposed, so about the dissolution of uh, uh, NGO uh, in case of non-compliance. Uh, we have a uh, uh, promise uh, from the members of parliament uh, they, that they will change it. Uh, uh, the first uh, sanction will be uh, some kind of uh, notice to comply with the obligation. The second uh, level will be a fine, and uh, the third level will be uh, after uh, the organization will not comply uh, with the notice and will not comply with the fine. Uh, after this, uh, the Ministry of Interior uh, will be able to petition for dissolution of uh, organization by the court. So we have uh, this agreement with the government office and with uh, members of parliament, the group of members of parliament. Um, hello, Erge Bafayos from FENRO, the German Development um, Organizations Association. I have a question to the Georgian case about the timing of the law um, and if you think there is any connection to the fact that, um, according to my information, a lot of Russian civil society exiled to Georgia after the um, full scale invasion. Is there any, like, more pressure at this moment in Georgia from Russia side to implement this law? Yeah, definitely. Whenever Georgia, uh, things are getting better in Georgia, of course, Russian influence and Russian pressure increase. Uh, it goes without saying that it's, uh, it's Russia who is benefiting uh, from all this, uh, all the, uh, things that are happening in, in my country, unfortunately. And ironically enough, only Russian politicians are uh, praising Georgian government for doing things like that. The rest of the friends of Georgia are just uh, mad at Georgian government, but Russian politicians are saying that you guys are doing great. Thank you so much. Uh, so definitely it's Russian influence, it's Russian uh, pr uh, pressure and um, I, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm not the right person to comment uh, on that, and, and I also don't want to go into conspiracy uh, theories, but it feels like Kremlin is controlling the entire uh, uh, thing now. Thank you. Uh, my name is Marian Čaučík. I'm a member of parliament. Uh, for Christian Democratic Movement here in Slovakia and opposition, opposition party. Before that, I was working 
29 years in the NGO sector, so I'm fighting this um, new, new law that is coming to our parliament, of course. And from our experience, what is crazy is that the politicians, the government politicians, they have been inspired um, fighting against NGOs, they say political NGOs, NGOs that have political influence and they want to limit somehow. And what is the crazy thing is it's coming from the coalition MPs, members of parliament, not through the government, where the normal procedures apply and consultations. So um, maybe my advice would be, if possible, Ministry of Interior insists on that, that it must, such a law must go through the process, through the normal process, and not just that few members of parliament would put it there, and then it's just up to their will, because they have 79 majority, so in the second reading, if they want, they will pass it. And I think this is unfair, not only in Slovakia, but also in other, other countries, we should try to push. If, if it goes about transparency, fine, but let's discuss with the stakeholders, with those who are affected. Let's slow down the, the process, one thing. And maybe another advice could be, let's put together the information we have from the European, European side, from, from the other countries, and I think it would be good if NGOs can get support from their own clients and those people they are working for so that they will stick to them in this discussion, especially in public discussion around these laws. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the uh, picture behind. Uh, I have uh, one question here, then the second one is Feather over there and then the lady in the white sweater. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. My name is Privilege uh, Kandira. Um, I'm with Forum uh, from Norway. Uh, pro uh, I might not be very privy to, to the East and um, to, to European cases more. But uh, I'd want to bring in also uh, another side where I come from. I come from Zimbabwe. So we, are also, we have an authoritarian um, uh, regime, government, uh, and they got recommendations um, from FT. I will not mention the, 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 the recommendations. But I, I feel, I strongly feel, that um, one, from a layman point of view, the purpose of policy and law is to control behavior and freeze power, number one. Number two, I, feel, I strongly feel that enacting this into a single law acts as a dragnet to drag everyone. I've listened to you say when you mentioned that there are different forms of uh, civic organizations, why don't you then target a specific clause that will open up and assimilate organizations that are not covered by that specific clause, rather than to make it as an absolute law, a stand on on its own? I feel, I, I feel like if, if it happens so, then somewhere, somehow, power is being frozen. Yeah, I think um, my question to you is why, why, how, uh, why can't you spe specifically select a clause that is missing the definition rather than to have um, this play around interest, objectives, politically, and what so forth. But by definition, civic organization, they're supposed to contribute to that work politically to say. So why don't you then revisit a single clause? Thank you. Yes, we are recommending uh, uh, to the government that uh, if uh, there is in uh, one, of, uh, one type of uh, civil organization, especially uh, civil uh, assemblies, uh, if there is missing an obligation 
to press uh, an uh, annual report. So uh, focus only on this type of organization. This is our recommendation. So I think that we will think, uh, we think similarly. My question is to Ivana, once again, Fedor Borschak from OSF, uh, regarding the, uh, your argument against the, the democracy of the defense. You said that there is a de the, the, it's a definition, so I didn't get it uh, quite clear. Maybe you can elaborate on that, since I, uh, the, what I know from the act is that the, uh, qualifi the qualification for uh, being registered as, a, as an um, uh, interest representative of the, f of the third country uh, there should, it's, it's uh, ruled out in the act that the mere financing is not sine qua non uh, condition for that. So it doesn't mean that if uh, you receive money from US, UK, whatever, that qualifies you automatically to register as a, for, uh, as a, as a interest representative of UK, US, whatever. So can you clarify on that? Yes, thank you. Thank you, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, so yes, there you're right that uh, there needs to be some form of an agency relationship and uh, there is even like an exception for, um, I mean, it's, it's not specifically in the, in the proposal itself, like uh, in, the, in the articles, but in the preamble that the core funding uh, would be potentially exempt. But what does it mean then? Uh, like, it's very unclear, like, how this, uh, you know, agency relationship is defined. Is it defined in the contract? Does it say that, like, the donor has to tell you, like, oh, you have to do this and that? Does it already, like, uh, constitute this agency relationship? It's, it's very vague. It's not very clear, like, uh, what would constitute this agency relationship and what wouldn't. Um, another thing is that a lot of organizations are, uh, you know, project funding based. Would it mean that uh, when you receive a grant um, that that constitutes uh, an agency relationship just because it's not uh, core funding? Then another thing is that um, if core funding is really, core funding is really like exempt, uh, it's not only in the preamble, but it's like specifically also mentioned in the provisions. Uh, of the, um, basically, like, would it really uh, de deter, you know, uh, these bad actors from, like, uh, using this exception for, <laughs> you know, for, like, influencing uh, policies? Like, then, you know, like, it's, it's very unclear how they are going to, like, clamp down on, um, on this covert foreign interference through these types of provisions. Like, if they if they don't clarify these kind of things, and even if they do, like how is it going to like um, basically clamp down on what they are trying to say, the interference of uh, of foreign powers? I don't know if I answered uh, clearly. Do you are you satisfied with my answer? <laughs> <laughs> I mean. Thank you. I, um, I'm Jordan Avery. I work for the European Civic Forum, um, but I'm here representing uh, the working group uh, of, uh, on civic space by Civil Society Europe, uh, which is a network of European networks, and we are working very closely with, uh, on the Defense of Democracy package. Maybe I can just answer, add to what Ivana was saying uh, on the core funding that uh, um, the, there are two big issues with this uh, legislation. First of all, as Ivana was saying, um, it's not the, um, the, the tool is not matching the aim of, uh, uh, of the legislation. Uh, and second, there, it's so badly drafted, um, clearly in a rush, that uh, there is a lot of uh, legal uncertainty regarding how this would uh, be implemented. And so what we are hearing uh, is that the member states, man, several member states are not eager either to have these uh, implemented. I have uh, three questions. <laughs> um, the first one uh, is regarding the defense of democracy package. Um, so I'm curious to hear from 
uh, the representative from the Slovak government, uh, how this directive is perceived um, in the country. Uh, the second question is uh, um, about uh, the proposal in Slovakia uh, for foreign agents. Um, it's always interesting to hear these arguments on the need to increase transparency for civil society organizations. And my question is, have you considered expanding these, to, these proposal to other entities that influence the policy making uh, companies uh, um, and sometimes corporations from yeah, um, global corporations that uh, often are not captured by these kind of uh, uh, measures. Um, and the third question, uh, always for the representative of the Slovak government, is to what extent the, the, um, the pressure coming from the EU is having an impact in your discussions? I will start uh, with the second question. Uh, yeah, it will be uh, <coughs> nice uh, if uh, all the companies, all the uh, organization will be transparent, but I can speak only uh, for the NGOs, for the civil organizations, because uh, in uh, our, oh, our agenda consists of uh, strengthening uh, the position of NGOs in uh, Slovak Republic. So we cannot uh, speak what the commercial companies should or should not do. We can only, uh, I'm not Ministry of Interior. I am uh, from the Office of Plenipotentiary for the Civil Society Development. So it's different. We are uh, counseling body for the government, but we are not the government. So we can only recommend. And uh, recommending something in the area of uh, commercial companies is uh, not our thing, you know. But, uh, yeah, you are right. If uh, something is applied to some type of uh, organization, it should be applied to all of organization. The law should be applied... Uh, there shouldn't be some excuses for... Uh, you should uh, oblige uh, this and... Uh, you shouldn't, you know, and, uh, sorry, the third question was? Um, so how has the EU stance worked? Uh, is impacting or affecting uh, the different organizations on the way the EU stands? Uh, again, we as uh, the Office uh, of Plenipotentiary, we agree with European Commission, European Union. We have, uh, we have had consultation with uh, uh, Viera Jovrova. We have had consultation with uh, Mike O'Flaherty. And uh, uh, not just uh, based on these consultations, we recommended the government and the MEPs to change this law. So, uh, if you are asking if there is an influence, yes, it is, and uh, we, we agree. In this uh, field, we agree with European Commission, European Parliament, OECD, and other uh, international organizations. And, uh, sorry, the first question. <laughs> Mm, 
sorry, what package? I don't know if I uh, am able to answer this question because I don't see in the heads of the uh, members of government. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, this uh, proposal uh, is not perceived uh, in the society, is not perceived uh, as a good proposal. I don't know what the government is thinking, but regarding uh, uh, the arguments uh, before the uh, elections, uh, which uh, were uh, last year, uh, the politicians who are in, uh, in the government, uh, where oh, they wanted to pass this bill. They were uh, speaking publicly about foreign agents. But uh, now I think that uh, they are uh, maybe not thinking differently, but uh, I think that uh, they may be um, will step back from this because uh, uh, of the pushing from, uh, <coughs> from the European Commission and also from uh, our civil society organizations because we discussed uh, this thing with the Council of uh, Government of, uh, for uh, uh, non-governmental organizations and uh, they, uh, their position is very strict. Thank you, Bistri. Ivana Tamar, would you like to add something? Otherwise, we are run out of time. So, thanks a lot for detailed overview and especially thanks to Bistrik and Tamar for being that open uh, in your answers, for giving us uh, such a deep uh, insight and uh, uh, giving us the opportunity to, uh, to have that overview, how, how, it works, uh, how it works practically. And uh, I would like also to thank you for your questions and for, for your interest and uh, um, for your interest in, in, that, uh, in that topic. And I deeply hope that you enjoy also the rest of the Umbrella Development Forum. And uh, thanks a lot once more and have a nice afternoon.